the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. O heavenly King, O Comforter, the Spirit of truth, who art in all places and fillest all things, treasury of good things and giver of life, come and dwell in us, and cleanse us from every stain, and save our souls, O gracious Lord. Amen. May the words of my mouth and meditation of our hearts be pleasing to you, O Lord, our Rock and our Redeemer. Amen. <clears throat> that very prayer that I've opened up with every time that I've taught. We've got to see the truth in what we're praying. We commented on this months ago. That very prayer is an absolute wrecking ball to the idea of a distant God. Some two-story universe of God and His kingdom, which we've been talking about. We get so deceived into living in that two-story universe where, again, we believe God is near when we're doing the Christian things. When we're out and about in our normal world, which is most of our life, we tend to treat Him as if He departs upstairs to some distant place and is nowhere near us, and that's why we're not attentive to Him. That very prayer is a wrecking ball to that whole idea. Listen to the words, Who art in all places and fillest all things. There's never a time that He does not. Giver of life, we say. He is active always on our behalf in offering His life to us. Always. Dwelling in us. Cleansing us. Saving us. These are dynamic statements you hear in this prayer of the salvation of God through the experienced union we have. The relationship that we are now afforded once again by the God who created us and loves us that much. And that's why. This statement I'm going to read to you by Father Stephen Freeman in his book, Everywhere Present, which gave us just merely the framework of talking about the kingdom of God. But this is why his statement rings so true. Let me read to you a couple of brief paragraphs. <clears throat> Father Stephen writes, For since the creation of the world, God's invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made even His eternal power and Godhead. What's He saying? Through everything He created, beginning with creation, and even still today in the fallenness of creation, all that God has created, He is using to meet us. He's using to reveal Himself to us. He's using to grant us an experience of Him, and that's why He says that we understand Him, which means we see Him, we receive His revelation, we understand Him through all that He's created. This is what we're after, is that constant experience of God in our lives. He goes on to write, he said, The entire world and all that is given to us is an icon. Another person can even be my entry as an icon into paradise, or just as clearly my entry into Hades. And both in a far deeper sense, he says, than something merely moral. Love alone reveals things for what they are and transforms them into what they were always intended to be. Love alone reveals the true shape of the universe. Huh? This is reality. This is what is supposed to be the Christian reality. And the question that comes to us as we conclude all of the things that we've looked at is this. What do we want? What do you want for your lives? What do you want for, and what do I want for my life as an experience of Christ in this present world, in all of its fallenness and the paradise of His church, the kingdom of God? What do we want? Do we want a heady, limited to information, albeit wonderful information faith? Is that what we want? Or do we want a life where the Word of God is living and present and we can experience the resurrected one in the moments of our lives, even the most boring, even in the most mundane, and see our lives absolutely transformed by that very experience in church and out of church while doing our laundry? That your lives can be transformed by the experience of God. Come on, it's cleaning, right? It's an act of cleansing. All of the mundane things that we do, God wants us to experience Him in all of these things. So let's, for just a few moments, <clears throat> backtrack and consider some of the things that have been revealed to us in this series. And I'm not going to go exhaustive on this. I'm just going to take a few moments to jog our memory. 
as we conclude this. One of the first things was for us to evolve beyond this experience of some two-story universe, which is a false religion. There is no such thing as Christianity that is a two-story experience. It does not exist. It does not exist. And the only reason it may exist for us is our allowing the, the deceits of Satan to remain. Where we think that all we see is all there is. And that's that. Or all we experience in certain moments is all there is to be experienced, no matter what we're doing. But for us to evolve beyond that two-story experience, we must, as St. Paul says, and we talked about this, be transformed by the renewal of our mind, our noose. That's the mind, the heart, every bit of reason that is within us, the thing that receives from without and projects back the noose, you see is what we're talking about. We need to be renewed in our minds. And with the renewal of our minds comes a far clearer eyesight and vision as to what truly is going on all around us at any given moment in our lives. You've heard the phrase, right, that there's more than meets the eye? Yes? In the kingdom of God, that phrase doesn't even do it justice. It doesn't even do it justice. How many of you saw the movie The Matrix? <clears throat> okay, for those of you that didn't, I'll talk to you as though you didn't, and everybody else will get it who has. In the movie The Matrix, you have the main character, Neo. And Neo exists in a world much like what we see and exist in. You know, we, we look around, we see people, we see people going to their jobs, we see buildings and cars, we see life as you and I know that it exists. However, everything that Neo is experiencing is entirely false. It's a false reality. It's not real. And Neo is offered a way by taking a certain color pill that if he takes that pill, his eyes will be open to the reality of the world that exists. And when he follows that path and takes that pill, he finds that the world is not everything that he has experienced. In fact, it's far darker far lesser. Everything is awful. He, he actually exists in a world after a nuclear holocaust caused by man trying to defeat artificial intelligence from taking over the world. They destroy their own world. This is the real world. But the matrix that he's been experiencing is the deceit. It is the lie that the artificial intelligence has used to keep all of humanity in proper bondage. Okay. And what I want us to see from that, that the matrix is an incredible deception, again, like I said, to keep everyone under control. Now, take the concept of that movie and turn it absolutely inside out as far as what must happen for all of us in Christianity. Pull it completely in the opposite direction. You'll have the journey that all of us as sons and daughters must be on with the living God, those to whom God has created and granted his eternal kingdom in the eternal now, as well as forever. You see, right now, we are actually living in the lesser. We are existing in the lesser condition. Everything that exists in our world is not all that this world was created to be by God. That's true. And what happens is, unlike Neo, when he takes the pill and he sees the revelation of the truth, he sees the lesser existence. But for us, it's the, ex it's the exact opposite. When we press in and cooperate with the Holy Spirit, what happens to us? Everything we see around us blossoms. Everything around us comes into its full and true color. Everything around us we see as God created it to be. And we experience the unseen that is absolutely all around us all the time. The angels and the saints that are with us always, not just in the sacred space. You see, that are constantly warring for us and aiding us in our journey to Christ. Do you get the reference? We are going in the opposite direction of Neo, where our enlightenment expands us to be able to experience so much more than this fallen world provides for us. This is what we're after in all of this through that enlightenment. But this only happens... And it's only going to happen with the people who give themselves over to God for the renewing of their minds. 
the healing of our brokenness within. And when it's healed, our vision, it's, it's like putting on glasses. You're blurry now, and now I see clearly and so much more. That's what happens in our life in Christ. A second theme Father James has been presenting is the constant theme of the activity of God by creation and recreation being the same movement of God, both creation and recreation being the same movement of God to save us, to restore us, giving us a way to not only become like Him, but to experience the fullness of what He'd always intended us to be and experience in all that He created of Himself. Father James has been sharing with us the creation story, and if we don't get the creation story, and quite frankly, it's very beautifully simple, even though it's high, there's so highly a lot of theological things that we could think about, it's the most beautiful, simple look at how God, literally molecule by molecule, created everything so that you could know Him, so that you could fellowship with Him. That's an amazing thought that we'll ponder the rest of our lives, and we should, and we should. Our salvation and our redemption is a return to that very blessed existence of intimate fellowship of children with our Heavenly Father. And taking that theme further, Father James has brought our attention to how this idea of creation and recreation is presented to us in the liturgical life and the prayer rhythm life of the church, which is our paradise, our experience of the kingdom of God. A gift to us from God so that God can completely offer us the ability to experience Him and see Him clearly and to come to know Him as it was always intended to be. And so the question is, what do we do? What do we do with all of this? Excuse me. I'm going to offer a number of thoughts. And I pray you'll lock into at least some of them. First is this. We have got to be a people that are always, we talked about it this morning, racing toward God. A people that are constantly moving, seeking, pursuing, desiring all that God has to offer, which means we are a people that must present ourselves to Him at all times, not just in the worship and the prayer times, but that our whole lives become the worship and prayer times. And we present ourselves to Him. It's as if I think our Lord is really saying to us through this series, Beloved, I am always ready to open the eyes of the soul of every one of you, to show you what is truly real, to give you the experience that you so desire of me. And then he looks at us and says, your move. Why does he say your move? Because our salvation is not contract, it's relationship. And there is no relationship but when two are moving toward one another. It's an impossibility. What do you want? It's our move. You see, God is a God whose nature is this. He is a God who longs to manifest Himself to show us who He is. He is a God whose nature is to reveal Himself to us so that we know Him. You guys know how much I love Charles Dickens' classic A Christmas Carol, right? And when I think of our Lord's nature... And what he's constantly calling to all of us. You remember the ghost of Christmas present, the second ghost? There's a line that came to me that really was a blessing because it honestly, it describes the invitation of the heart and nature of God to us all every second of every day. And when the ghost of Christmas present is introducing himself to the first time to Scrooge, he calls Scrooge into the room. And in a bellowing voice, he says, come in, come in and know me better, man. Come in and know me better, man. That is what our Lord Jesus Christ is constantly inviting the souls of His beloved to do. To come in, to come into that blessed fellowship where He promises if we do, He will show Himself to us so that we leave knowing Him better. And it's an eternal invitation. But the only way we can know Him better is to present ourselves to God with hearts that want to see Him know Him. To present ourselves to God, you do understand it's not a stationary proposition. You can't sit as a couch potato Christian and attend Sunday Mass and occasionally do your prayer times. That's not going to do it. He wants you to have everything that He offers. 
And the only way to have everything he offers, because he offers himself so completely, is for his people to offer themselves so completely. And there, the marriage of the bridegroom, right, and all of us happens over and over and over again. It's an active pursuit as a response to a divine invitation. That's what the life of the Christian is. And again, I go back to one of the most basic yet so profound scriptures that many of us learned as song in children. I say it many times here. But seek first. Seek what? Oh, no, no. You missed it already. Seek first. Seek above everything else. Nothing else comes before that in importance. Seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. Do you see His nature? You want it revealed? Seek Him. Seek Him above all other things. And His promise is, I'll lavish you with everything your heart desires and more. That's the nature of God. I'll respond to your seeking, but you got to seek. Seek first. In fact, that phrase, seek first, <clears throat> when you look at the language that it's written in, it literally means this. It means set your aim upon something like an expert marksman. You ever seen an expert marksman with his bow and his arrow and his eye? And how diligent and still and focused he is on the one aim? There's nothing else that matters to the marksman in the world in that split second or few seconds than finding his goal. And then he lets it loose. That's what it means to seek first the kingdom of God. St. Augustine says this about seek first the kingdom of God. He says, our final good is therefore the kingdom of God and His justice. We ought to seek this good and fix our aim upon it. Let us perform all of our actions, everything we do for the sake of obtaining it. Now, I don't ask you this question to shame, but to encourage. I mean that. So don't, if you take it the other way, you're not hearing. It, does that describe our spiritual life? Because I'm going to tell you right now, it doesn't describe mine entirely. That I perform all of my actions, everything I do in the days to obtain all that Christ has to offer in His kingdom. This is what He'll help us get to. If we're doing it this much, He'll help us get to this much. And you know what? Then when we offer Him from this much, He gets us to this much. Do you see the progression? It's a progression of relationship through life. It's not some snap of the finger magic. It's real relationship. Let's embrace it as real relationship. And every time we get a little bit, offer it back to God. Revel in the little bit that He shows us and let it encourage us. If I like that, how about this? And go further in pressing in to this relationship and this fellowship that we can have with our Lord Jesus Christ. <clears throat> we have a tendency to be so caught up in the millions of various distractions from a false world, a false world that keep us forever from setting our aim upon God and His kingdom. <clears throat> That's really our common reality, isn't it? That's where we struggle the most is with all the life distractions. And I'm, let me tell you something that's not a distraction. Your jobs are not a distraction. They can be. Your jobs are not a distraction. Your families are not a distraction. The things you have to do around the house to care for your house and your home are not a distraction, but all of them can be. Or they can be the very vehicles in those moments where we can experience God in all of those blessed things. That really is up to where we're going to set our eyes when we embrace those things we have to do throughout the day. Isn't that true? <clears throat> Second idea. As our minds are renewed over time, as we start seeing that renewal of mind, we start seeing glimpses of so much more that's around us. We have to be diligent to live in and from what we're being shown. Again, you know, I gave you that example of here's this much and then this much. The only way we grow, as Paul says, to be transformed from glory to glory. This is what Paul says, by seeing God. The only way that that happens is that as God renews and 
heals our mind, we have to then very disciplined live from that newness that he's given us. Or we go back to having poor vision. You know, here's the reality. The human will is a bugger. It's a problem. I say that tongue in cheek. It's also the greatest gift that God gave us that actually is in his image. And yet it is very problematic for us on our path of healing. You see, we can see things in the kingdom of God and God Christ reveals things about himself and about his kingdom. And we always can choose to clutter that, muddy it up, and go back to all the distractions we had before. Or we can so love what he's given us that it presses us to throw all of that continuously away and to keep our face all the more set for him so that he can transform us again and again. Do you get that? Does that make sense? <clears throat> this is what our journey is. And so let me give you some examples in a number of areas of our spiritual life where we, with changed and renewed minds, live differently. And I want to start with the liturgy and break out from there. Now, the liturgy we know is the joining of heaven and earth in the eternal worship of God. And it is liturgy that manifests for us the entirety of our life of salvation in Jesus Christ. His ministry to us, our offering of ourselves for healing to Him. Everything in the Christian life is in the liturgy. Bar none, nothing's missing. It's all there. And so to experience the kingdom of God in the liturgy, we can no longer walk into the holy temple, that sacred space in which we worship, and continue to see only physically. We've got to press beyond that. Because there's more in that sacred space and in that sacred timelessness when God's people gather together and God with them, where we enter in for a time timelessness. The eternal worship and experience of God is there to be had. We must, with the help of the Holy Spirit, see the fullness of that reality around us. So let's look at a couple things. When we even enter into the nave, we present ourselves eastward, eastward representing paradise to God, in the kingdom of God, that which we're in, which is our paradise. And at the same time, do we consider, as much as we faced eastward to encounter God, that God from paradise is moving and facing towards us so that we can experience Him? That there is a joint procession, if you will, that happens every time we meet for the divine liturgy. We come and move towards God and paradise eastward, and paradise unfolds, and the God of paradise moves towards us where we are. He comes right to us in our weaknesses. That is the reality of what is happening in there, whether you're experiencing it right now or not. That is the reality of what is happening in the liturgy. And when a Spurges happens, and I come to you with that blessed, holy, baptismal water, and I splash it upon you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and you hear the words, Thou shalt purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Thou shalt wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow, which comes from the old covenant practice of taking the blood of the sacrificial lamb on the hyssop and splattering upon the altar for the forgiveness of sins. And so when that baptismal water is coming to you, you have to begin to see through just the physical reality into the absolute reality. Our Lord is moving to you for your cleansing, for your healing, to take the baptism that you experienced in the past and to remember it in the true understanding of remembrance in that present moment. That I am baptized I have been cleansed by Christ and joined to Him and joined to all of these other people in this place so that I may offer all of ourselves and the world to God and God may offer Himself to us for our redemption and the redemption of the whole world. That's what's going on. And you know, please remember that when that procession of God comes your way, it flows from the altar, the east, from the altar down to you 
And if you remember, that comes from what we see in Ezekiel and in Revelation, that everywhere the water flows from the temple, death springs to life. That which is not healed is healed. In fact, we sing those very words during the Paschal Tide, during that time, time when we sing the Vidya Quam, I beheld water flowing from the temple. And the words that we sing, we are saying that that very water is here to heal us, restore us, and bring us back to life. These are the things we sing. We're singing not a reality of the past, a reality of the kingdom of God now. That's what we're doing. When the scriptures are read in the divine liturgy, we have to understand, and I've said this a few times, even in Vespers recently, that the word of God who spoke all things out of nothing, when the divine scriptures are read, is speaking again. The same God is speaking His words of life to bring us from, from death to life. He's planting seeds with every word that goes forth into our soil if we will have ears to listen. And not only ears to listen, but to listen as if the voice of God is speaking. Not the voice of a subdeacon, not the voice of a deacon, not the voice of a reader, but the voice of God is implanting His jewels of eternal life, His words of creation and recreation into your very soul. And are we sitting there listening to it as such, literally asking as the words are being read, what are you telling me? What do you want me to see about you? What do you want me to see about me? How can we come together in this moment? That's what should be happening as the scriptures are read in the liturgy. And then to take those words, and I include obviously the words of the sermon that come to us as well from whoever happens to be preaching do we take those words and cultivate them in our lives as we leave that place? And this is what we must be beginning to do. How about the gospel procession? Where does the gospel come from? Where do you see it come from? Where does it start? The altar. It starts at the altar like everything else. It starts at the altar and it comes downward. It comes down the steps in those moments we experience the wonder of the gospel who is Jesus Christ as we see Christ condescend from heaven. And where does it go? Right in the middle of all of you. What are we seeing? That Jesus comes. God, who is Christ, comes to us in our most sinful moments and doesn't shy away from us. And He comes right smack in the middle of us because the gospel is there to set us free in our souls. So when the God, next time you see the gospel procession, don't see a book and a deacon. See Jesus and embrace Him coming to you. Look for Him. Look beyond what you see to the reality that is. This is the common thing we're talking about today. You want to embrace and experience the kingdom of God? Look beyond to see God. He'll help you. And only by His help is it attainable. Only by His help can we see. Okay? Now I'm going to briefly go over this last thing from the liturgy. <clears throat> and from a sermon recently. Remember when I said we had that sermon where we had the leper and the centurion. And we see this enacted in the liturgy. When the priest turns around from the altar and he has the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ and he pronounces to you something, he's telling you to do something. When the priest says, behold the Lamb of God, look at Him. Behold Him. Be in awe. The Lamb of God is present with us. Now, He's with us. And what is our response to that? It is the centurion's humility and his great faith when you see the Lamb of God to say, Lord, I am not worthy that thou shouldest come under my roof. But here's the faith. But speak the word and my soul will be... We're talking to 
Jesus when we say that. And Jesus is before us when we say that. It's an encounter. And here's one of the most magnificent things that I didn't get to in the sermon. What is it that we do just after beholding Christ and in humility and great faith crying out for Him? He gives us Himself. What do we do right after that? We receive Him into ourselves. Yes, the priest does first. But we go immediately from beholding the Lamb of God and calling out to Him to speak your word and my soul will be healed. And Jesus in His loving mercy, now He comes once again and He gives us what we've asked for. If we've asked. If we've not just read a missal. That's not asking. Asking is embracing the reality and knowing Jesus is with us and letting the brokenness within your heart that you've already let the Holy Spirit show you even before you came or got shown to you during the Mass thus far. When we cry out that voice of the centurion, it is with the context of what needs to be healed within us. For the centurion, it was his servant who was paralyzed. For the leper, it was his leprosy. What is it for you? Because when he gives us himself, it is an act of mercy and healing. And that's exactly the transition. Do you see that flow? Let yourselves experience the reality of relationship and offered union. That Jesus is before us and present with us to give us every time we gather in divine liturgy. Does that at least intellectually make sense to you? And I pray it goes deeper for all of us. Pray for me that it goes deeper. Every one of us is always in the blossoming of this reality. And that will be forever until we see it in full in paradise beyond this veil. But we can see it now and be healed by it. And I'm not embellishing things in the liturgy to sound wonderful and pretty. I'm telling you what Jesus has prescribed as a means to come to us and heal everything within us. This is about His prescription, what we do in there. He sets the stage for union by all that we do in the divine liturgy. Embrace it. Look beyond the physical to see what Jesus is showing you of Himself. And that's where your mind will start to be renewed. And then we live from that renewal. I'm going to go over two more things and bring it to a close. So that's liturgy. What about the renewal of our mind when it comes to the reading and experience of Christ through the reading of divine and holy scripture? I want to talk about this for a second. What's our experience reading scripture? <clears throat> And I really ask you to think about it. Think about when you read the Scriptures, whether you're doing your own Bible study or if you're reading the Scriptures that are to go along with our morning and evening prayers and the lectionary or whatever. What's your experience in reading Scripture? Are you stuck in a form of reading as an intellectual exercise just as we would do with studying or reading for pleasure any other secular books? Are we stuck where the reading of Holy Scripture is stuck right here at the most northern part of our being? Or are we reading Scripture as a prayerful form of communion and fellowship with God, just as I described when I, when I said how to be attentive to the Scriptures that are being read in liturgy or in prayer services? That it is the Word of God who's sitting at table with us. It is the words of God, the very words of God that created life in the beginning are speaking to us when we read Holy Scripture, no matter what context it is. How is it that we're experiencing or reading Scripture? Jesus is longing to grant us a revelation, an epiphany of Himself when we prayerfully read Scripture with open hearts. It's a form of communion and fellowship with Him, you see. Let the Word of God speak His words directly to our soul. Father Stephen Freeman, in his book, Everywhere Present, he said this about Scripture. Scripture is lost to us when it's reduced to mere facts. Icons do with color what Scripture does with words. Those who wrote and interpreted Scripture are the same ones who painted and understood the icons. You see, it's more 
than just some on a page. The early church fathers, <clears throat> there's one in particular that actually says this, but so many of them speak to this, that say those who fail to know Scripture fail to know Christ. Those who fail to know Scripture fail to know Christ. Why? Well, I'll tell you this. It's certainly not simply from reading information about God and Jesus. That's not it. We won't know Christ like that. We only know Christ by His revelation through fellowship. It's the only way we know Christ. No, but if we read Holy Scripture prayerfully and with a hunger to see, again, looking beyond the page to hear His voice speaking to us, as if, again, picture Him. When you read Scripture, use some mental games. Picture our Lord Jesus Christ sitting across the table from you speaking to you. Whatever it takes to help you get beyond just reading and more hearing and listening as a disciple would if he was sitting with his disciples teaching them the ways of the kingdom of God. That's what we want out of Holy Scripture. And you know what? The, <clears throat> the teacher at the clergy retreat that I was on that was fantastic. And I'll be sharing more of things that he shared and, and that I was blessed by in the future. But as he was teaching, one of the things that he made very clear is that from the very first word of Holy Scripture to the very last word of Holy Scripture, every word points to Jesus. Every word reveals Christ. Every word is something Christ can use to tell us about Himself, ourselves, and have that fellowship. In fact, in the Old Testament... We see Jesus through types, and we see Jesus through theophanies. And I wish I could, I do not have time to even delve into any of that right now, but I tell you this, I was so struck by remembering some of these things that I have a feeling that when we return after a summer break in the fall, that we are probably going to have our adult discipleship on the types and theophanies that reveal Jesus Christ both in the Old Testament but also point to where we see the very same thing in Jesus in the New. That's something that's weighing on my mind. I'm going to keep revisiting. But we see Him in the types and we see Him in the theophanies and then we see Him in the incarnation, make no mistake, in the New Covenant, in the New Testament. But we see Him all the way. And you know, when He was talking about this, <clears throat> something came to my mind. As a way to see Holy Scripture, I was reminded of a, of a painting, a drawing that I had seen. Have you ever seen those a painting of, you can tell it's the shape of our Lord Jesus Christ in the painting. You know it's Him. But there are no features. The only thing in the painting that shapes Christ are the Gospels. The words from the Holy Gospels. Have any of you seen that? I, I saw one of these and it blew me away. The, the writing was so tiny. But it, you knew it was Jesus Christ from a distance. And you got up close and it was the Gospels that shaped Him. This is what we're talking about in the experience of Christ and in the divine reading of Scripture. When we read it, He's there to, to give us His shape. You see? To reveal Himself to us in every reading if we're looking and if we hunger after it. Does that make sense? We have to get beyond the words of the page and our past habits with Scripture reading and our Western thinking about Scripture reading and embrace what we're talking about here. The last thing I'll cover in these last few minutes, what about the renewal of our minds regarding prayer? Our prayer life. When I say that it must increase and deepen for the kingdom of God to be manifest in us, through us, and around us, I'm not talking about a time frame of prayer. Okay? Now, truly, we should pray without ceasing. There's no question. But I'm talking about our pre How do we even see prayer? How do we view prayer? We, when I talk about it and we talk about it conversationally as fellowship with God, is that our experience in prayer? Or are we reading the liturgical prayers on the hours of prayers? Thank God we're doing that. That's a great beginning. Is it all? Because if it's all, we are not entering in to the blessed fellowship our Lord wants to have with us in prayer. You see, it begins with the liturgical prayers 
only so that those prayers, which are very important, can usher us into the experience fellowship with our God that He so desires with those that He loves. I want to share something with you now that I did gain from instruction at the retreat. And it's something magnificent and beautiful about prayer. The way that he voiced this resonated in me for some reason, and so I'm going to share it with you. And it has everything to do with thinking of prayer in terms of our newly created identity in Christ, which is each one of us has become the holy temple. The holy temple. We know this. Paul says it. Where does God dwell? Right here. Right here. <clears throat> in Matthew chapter 6, Jesus says this, But you, when you pray, go into your room, and when you have shut your door, pray to your Father who is in the secret place, and your Father who sees in secret will openly reward you. Now, now, you go a long time, and some people think that the secret place is the closet he told you to go and pray in. And, you know, that's an innermost place of most people's homes, quiet, away from everything else. We might be tempted to think that, but it's not true. Go into the closet, and then in the closet, pray to your Father who's in the secret place. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you openly. Now consider that language, the secret place. In the Old Covenant tabernacle and temple, what room would you say was the secret place? The Holy of Holies, the most holy place. What was in the most holy place? The Ark of the Covenant, the Ark of the Presence, Right? And we know that the, the, the high priest would only go into that most secret place once a year. And it was in that once a year interceding in the secret place, in the most holy place, that the sins of the entire nation, of the priest himself and his family, would be washed away by the communion with God, the intercession that occurred in the secret place. You see, in the tabernacle... And in the temple, there were three main areas. There was the courtyard, which was the place where the people would come and offer their sacrifices. You might think of this as the nave. And what are we sacrificing in the nave? Ourselves. We offer ourselves, right? But you had the courtyard where those sacrifices took place. And then you had the holy place. Now, the holy place was in between the courtyard and the most holy place. And in the holy place... You had things like, this is where the priests would minister very often. And in that place, you'd have the lampstand, the table of showbread, and I could go on and on. And one day we will about how all of that shows the Eucharist. But there you have it all in that place, and the priest would minister in there. And what is Jesus saying? Find me, pray to the Father in the secret place. Let me share with you what the teacher shared from St. Maximus the Confessor. And it's about me and it's about each one of us as temple of God, as the temples of God and prayer. And I sum up what he had shared from St. Maximus the Confessor. He says, ontologically, and that word simply means the way and order in which we were created by God. In his order. Ontologically, there are three main areas of the human person. Okay? And he likens it to the three main areas of the temple. First, you have the courtyard or the nave. St. Maximus the Confessor says the nave is the body, everything physical. The holy place is the noose, the mind, the heart, the place of reason as we talked about. I don't want to go any further into what the noose is, but that's the second place moving closer. The soul is the holy of holies. The soul is the holy of holies, the place, listen to what St. Maximus says, the place where Yahweh now dwells, because you're his temple. The place we now tabernacle in fellowship and intercession with God and he with us. See yourselves as the holy temple that you are. 
see yourselves as that. And when you pray in front of your iconography in that sacred space, when you pray, pray inward. Pray in the secret place. Be with your heavenly Father in intercession. He will be with you. He is with you. Do you see that What where St. Maximus the Confessor is going with this? Prayer is more than mouthing words. Prayer is more than stating desires, even if they're good desires, and even if those liturgical prayers shape Christ for us. These are all necessary. Prayer is so much more. It is being in the secret place of who you are with God who is there present, ready for you. Press inward. Press inward in your prayer life. And perhaps when we look at ourselves in that type of illuminated light, we'll see just what Jesus meant when He said in St. Luke in chapter 17, Indeed, the kingdom of God is, and what does He say? Within you. The kingdom of God is within you. So my friends, we need to present ourselves to God and as our mind is renewed to live from that renewal. And we offer back to Him the new and clearer vision that we've received in order that we might be offered more. And I conclude with this thought. God, and we see it right at the beginning of creation, is the divine writer and painter and creator of icons, of icons, icons all around us that are given to us to reveal himself to us in his nature because he is a God who wants to be known. The greatest thing we can do is seek him out in all that he's created, in everything that is around us, even one another, for each one of us is now a living icon. I need you and to see Christ in you to behold Him. That's why we're given one another. That's why we help each other in this race. We encourage and exhort one another in this race because we desperately need for these icons to shine forth. Every last one of us. And then we'll experience and dwell in the manifest kingdom of God. I know this has been a lot, and I know today even has been a lot that there is no way better to end everything that we have been doing with knowing how to move forward with it. But just like I mentioned a moment ago, our Lord is constantly offering. It really is our move. It is our move whether we experience the kingdom of God together and as individuals. And I really want to with all of you. Let's stand. <laughs> In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. God bless you all.